And thank you for joining us on a special edition of Post Game Central on Sports Map Radio. My name is Brian Scheibel, and this week I had the opportunity to speak with Gabe Polsky and Stephen Warshaw, the director and star of the Universal Pictures release Red Penguins, which you can find on video on demand and streaming services. It's a gripping documentary that recounts the time when American investors took over a controlling interest of the Soviet Union's Central Red Army hockey team. With the apparent fall of the Iron Curtain, as well as numerous Soviet players leaving the motherland for the National Hockey League, the so-called greatest team in the world suddenly found itself playing in front of empty arenas. Penguins owners saw a unique opportunity to capitalize on the Soviets' discombobulation, and they turned to their enigmatic marketing executive, Warshaw, to lead this enterprising opportunity. What comes next are all the fun hijinks and shenanigans you might find in minor league sports, except for this omnipresent criminal element that constantly reminds viewers there's much more at stake than a hockey game. Mikhail Gorbachev has been removed from power, and there are tanks in the streets of Moscow. This was a vast country with a history of hockey. We couldn't believe that one of the greatest teams was on the verge of extinction. Now an American team has a stake in Russian hockey, rescuing an entire sport from thin ice. It's complete chaos. Trust me, I'll make you a good capitalist. (laughs) The Red Army team is 50% owned by the Pittsburgh Penguin and a group of investors that includes movie and TV star Michael J. Fox. And you called them what? Uh, Well, they're called the Russian Penguins. In the beginning, we didn't understand the risk. We didn't understand what the country was like. I had the special talent of creating a firestorm inside arenas. Stevie figured, well, these strippers would make great cheerleaders. We just did whatever the hell we wanted there. People wanted to see the freak show, so they came. It's becoming the hottest ticket in Moscow. The U.S.-Russian partnership was going to be the model for the future. And that's how Disney got involved. Oh, boy! I'm going to be rich! Did you get a bad feeling? Yes. It got dangerous. When people are doing serious business, they show different sides of their characters. This is the mob. They had two ways of controlling people. Greed and fear. Everybody had bodyguards. And in walks the general. And all of a sudden he takes his fist. I think this guy might be hitting me. (laughs) Wild days. Well, as you know, there's no rules in Russia. That's our slogan. And as we continue here on Post Game Central Sports Map Radio, I'm Brian Scheibel, along with Gabe Polsky and Stephen Warshaw from the Red Penguins movie, available now on demand and streaming. Gabe, talk about the process in taking this movie through the festival circuit and the response you've received along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think people have been pretty surprised that the story actually happened and, you know, exists. The people were familiar with somehow a little bit of the success that was happening over there, but they didn't realize, like, the the end result. And because, uh, you know, purposely, you know, no one wanted to show at that time how things were failing over there in Russia. Mm-hmm. And uh, this this turned into a really dark story. You know, I've, I've gotten really good reviews and good critical response to the movie, some of the top kind of film entertainment critics and you know audiences seem to really love it i've been you know accepted to a lot of the major festivals and uh other festivals as well and uh there's just a lot of interest in the in in the film because i think you know it's it's, people you know it's not just a sports film it's a film kind of that about politics human nature international trade culture uh, business there's a lot of layers in the story that make it kind of beyond you know, a sports story. In fact, you know, I think one of the fun things for this, for me, was the fact that there wasn't very much uh, sports, whereas Red Army, my, my other film about the Soviet Union and the kind of the Red Army dynasty had, had quite a bit because the hockey was so good and interesting. Here we have 
you know, this is more of kind of a exploring an experiment of a business deal, sports business deal. It was actually one of the first international sports sports joint ventures, you know, in, in history. Let's talk about your first documentary, Red Army, a film highly recommended uh, seeing alongside Red Penguins. It's not a prequel, but it definitely shows how far the sport fell in a very short period of time. Hall of Famer Slava Fetisov is a name most U.S. sports fans would have at least heard of, but you revealed sides of him that I don't think anyone's ever seen before. When the big red machine gets rolling, they're mighty hard to stop. Although they don't show emotion, let's face it, they're a microcosm of their society. They score! It was a totalitarian. The KGB guys were always there. And it is sheer folly for us not to make every conceivable preparation to win. Okay. I just like kind of a few things about because basically what I'm trying to get on the film is, is what, what it was like to live in the Soviet Union. Yeah, and describe your feeling about okay, here. I'm about busy it. now. Hold on. Oh, okay. some business. Whatever. Well, I know he later refers to you as a good guy in the movie. There had to have been a point where you thought, is Slava just going to get up and storm out of the room? Yeah, I mean, I could tell he, he was getting kind of pissed off occasionally, but... I, there's something there where I kind of knew he had, otherwise he wouldn't keep talking, you know, some some kind of respect. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I tend to come across a little bit informal in my interviews, and I'm not, I just kind of go by instinct. I'm not, like, you know, buttoned up and, you know, too formal. You know, I, I try and engage them however I can, but also just kind of going after stuff that they don't, really talk about and you know even if it pisses them off a little bit somehow they sense they like what i'm trying to get at i find some of your editing choices to be really fascinating you're not afraid to leave the camera on the subject maybe long after a thought to really capture those moments you know i think the stuff that they don't say is maybe sometimes more interesting than what they say and you know the reactions are certainly very telling i i do that in a lot of my films and Maybe I don't take myself too seriously. Then maybe some of the questions get into some some very uh, touchy territory. Stephen, talk about your experience this past year in promoting the movie through different festivals and now seeing this release to such a wide audience. Well, it's certainly been nice to uh, be a little bit more relevant in the world. Um, you know, you get into, you turn 60 and you become Mr. Irrelevant, like the last pick in the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's really what it's done. It's, it's opened a lot of old friendships and, um, it's really, I've spoken to some people in Russia that I haven't spoken to in 25 years. And certainly a lot of the NHL players that have seen the film are calling me and letting me know how exciting it was for them who, who played at Seska now to see this film. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, a great ride. So how do you go from being in the marketing and sales group there in Pittsburgh to all of a sudden being sent off to Moscow. Well, at the time, uh, I was uh, at IMG uh, representing some of the sports world's top team sports stars like Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux, Brett Hull, Yarmer Yager, Joe Montana, Herschel Walker, some interesting uh, stars. And at the time, I was sort of flirting with the notion of buying my own International Hockey League franchise, uh, and we were going to put a team in Sacramento, call ourselves the Beasts, and then take a licensing agreement with Disney, and the logo was going to be the Beast from the Beauty and the Beast and oh, with okay. a hockey stick. Um, at the last minute, um, Fred Comrie, who owned the San Diego Gulls, thought my idea was great, so he took the affiliation from Disney and Anaheim, and I ended up going to Moscow to work with the Red Penguins, Russian Penguins. It was a dump. The lights were out. Everything had been either stolen or broken. The plexiglass wrapping around the rink, you couldn't see through it. And where we would have super boxes, there were electricians and workers living in there. I couldn't get over just how much of a mess the arena, known as the Ice Palace, was in. What were your expectations upon arrival? 
I mean, to be honest, you know, we had no earthly idea what we were about to face. Um, you know, to, we, all we knew was the evil empire, the Iron Curtain, and and this famous hockey team, the Red Army hockey team. You know, we knew about Fabergé eggs, and we knew about oil, and very little else about Russia. So for me, as a cultural anthropology student at Syracuse, I went over there basically as a tabula rasa. I mean, I, I didn't know what to expect. And boy, did we learn quickly that it was, it almost looked like the scene in uh, Lebanon when a bomb went off, you know, just absolutely the country was decimated and there was no money and there was no infrastructure and there was no understanding of capitalism. So that's when the oligarchs took advantage of that. They were the only business people that spoke the language of capitalism and they were able to, to cash in and really take most of the country for themselves. The Zamboni driver was a former brain surgeon. You know, he uh, he was making more money cleaning the ice than doing surgery. And um, it was sort of a, he was the canary in the coal mine for me. You know, it's just that look what's happened to this, you know, proud country. And, and that's sort of the sad part for me is that the United States had a great opportunity to embrace a, a foe that is, you know, in complete disarray um, the same way we did with Japan and Germany after the war. And, you know, look at our relations today with these countries. They're pretty strong. And it's a shame that we didn't make that same decision to embrace our former foe and to, to help them when they were down. And you can see the result of not helping someone when they're down. As soon as they get up, they're going to crush you again. And that's what's happening right now. You know, I thought no scene best conveyed just what the people are going through more so than the scene where the young fam won the Jeep in the on-ice promotion. I mean, what a paradox of emotions was on display there. And in one regard, he's he's happy. You could tell, wow, I just won a big prize. And in the other, it's, he had this look of fear in his eyes, like, I may not make it out of here alive. Yeah, no, there, there's no such thing as, insur as car insurance in Russia back then. You know, if your car got stolen... Tough noogies. And um, so this was a young man. What we did is we didn't announce the night that we were giving the Jeep away until everyone was in the building because we didn't want some sort of scam where everyone, someone was going to buy most of the tickets because they were pretty cheap um, and then guarantee themselves the Jeep. So we announced it to the crowd once they were inside. We gave them admit one tickets um, and we had the other half. And then we had uh, one of the legends, Alexander Ragulin, pick out the winning 10 tickets to shoot out for the car. Um, unfortunately, Scandal is, is no stranger to even legends of the Red Army. And that night, uh, Ragulin stuck his own ticket in the fishbowl, and he became one of the 10 finalists. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see even when we had well-intentioned promotions, they went awry. But the, it was a scary moment because, right, the, we had the two finalists of, after the shootout each get a key to the car. One went to the driver's side, one went to the passenger side. Whoever's door opened won the car, and the kid won the car. He was about 25 years old, and that's when he came up to me and said, listen, uh, through an interpreter, hey, I can't take this car because it'll be stolen by tomorrow morning. And so literally right on the ice, he negotiated the deal with the Chrysler Aviatica Motors owner in Moscow. And he, it was about a $30,000 Jeep. And he took, I believe, 10000 cash and just said, that's great, and walked away. That was the ending of that promo. And some of these promotions were really quite remarkable. I couldn't couldn't believe the sight of seeing bears on the ice serving beer. Yeah, well, the circus was in town, and um, there were bears in the basement, and I, you know, I, I couldn't help but notice the cages, and and so I found out what was happening, and I met this terrific bear trainer, and I asked her if she could help me with the promotion with my big sponsor, which was Iron City Beer out of Pittsburgh, and I said, boy, I said can they do anything on the ice? She said, well, do anything that you want. A really inviting uh, promoter that she was. And so we worked out a deal where we set up a table on the ice um, where we had people dressed nicely, and then this bear came out with the beer, carrying the beer, and put the beer on the table, served the beer. And then, the be then we had the trainer actually have the, beer, the bear chug a beer in front of the crowd, which was a great, a great moment. So it was a good moment for our sponsors. But 
we did crazy, uh, crazy, crazy ideas that we did plan. Like, for instance, we had barrel jumpers. Remember the old barrel jumpers in the 20s and 30s? Um, oh, sure. So we, we set up barrels, and we had some of the younger kids on the junior teams see how many barrels. I can't remember the record if it was 15 or 17 barrels. Um, but, the, you know, the crowd loved this. We had, um, we had speed skating races between periods. So we had the, the junior teams, where they'd have numbers on their back of the sections in the arena, and that, whoever won, that section would win free ice cream from Baskin Robbins. And the rules were that there were no rules. So these kids could elbow, kick, smash people into the boards, whoever finished the race first. <laughs> so it was, good, it was good optics for the fans. Um, but, you know, we had sophisticated promotions, too. It wasn't all strippers and free beer and bears drinking beer. We, we actually had uh, the first few nights uh, were Legends Nights where we retired the jerseys of the great legends of the Red Army, uh, Almietev, Alexandrov, Sologubov, Tregubov, Karlamov, and Bobrov were the first six. And then finally, the greatest of them all, uh, Vladislav Trechak. Uh, we honored him and his family, and he hoisted his banner up to the rafters his number 20 so we realized we had to balance sophisticated promotions with crazy um and i think we we accomplished that i thought one of the truly iconic characters of this movie has to be the gentleman who played the penguin mascot how did you meet him and what was he like to be around he was a character. I met him at the rink. He was a jazz promoter. So in the film, you, you'll, you'll see that we have a strip club called the Red Zone in the basement. We also had a jazz club. Um, and unfortunately, not many Russians cared about American jazz. Um, so he was this clever promoter with no fans and, <laughs> and no one coming to his club. And he's got a great name. His real name is Alexander Von Bush. <laughs> and so, you know, right around the Bush presidency, you know, right after Clinton, you know, his name became even more relevant in the country. And one night I realized, you know, the opening night is coming and I, I took the mascot uniform, put it on, skated around routines, and then I needed to find someone to do this during the games. And he was one guy who was not that drunk, and I said, hey, come here. <laughs> so I said, can you skate? And he could barely skate. And I think you see in the film, he trips and falls. Um, he was very clumsy, very clumsy mascot. Um, and it got kind of weird because Russia didn't understand mascots. Um, it was, that was foreign to them as well. And so a lot of the fans took offense to it, and they would throw beer at him, insult him. He was beaten one night badly by some fans. Uh, you know, so very, everything that happened while we were there was insane. And you mentioned the mascot, and that's a great story. A jazz promoter ending up, who can't skate, ending up as our mascot, being beaten and tortured by the fans. Very strange. But in the film, he is important, and I think he sums up the film beautifully, that, you know, that I was dealing with a Leviathan, this sort of Russian monster that was going to eventually crush me and crush the team and he was absolutely right so he was very prescient for a for a mascot you were in there at your own risk if you weren't going to play their game of paying people off we felt like we were losing control i said to valeri gushin we're expecting you to steal a hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars a year but you stole a million from us last year. And welcome back to Post Game Central on Sports Map Radio. I'm Brian Scheimel, and I'm speaking today with Gabe Polsky and Stephen Warshaw of the new Universal Pictures film, Red Penguins. Well, you heard in the clip mention of Valeri Gushin, the Central Red Army's general manager. Quite a character he is. But Gabe, I wanted to ask you, tell me about the first time you met Stephen and really how this project launched. Yeah, I mean, I, I was promoting Red Army at some of the festivals, and Steve came up to me. I didn't know who he was, and he just, you know, kind of, he looked like a little bit of a jokester, you know, I don't know, because he just started to say, hey, you know, well, this is a great movie, but, you know, I've got this other story. It's crazy. You wouldn't believe it about this Red Army team, and I, I just, like, was really not about it, you know, just because I had just done this big 
film about uh, you know Red Army Team, or, and I just I just like kind of, but he was very persistent. And eventually, kind of, I, I started looking into the, some of the things he was sending me. Steve had hoarded over 20 years, like basically everything about this team, the, the, the tickets, the contracts, photos. I mean, you name it, everything. And I and I just kind of poured through this stuff and said, wow, this is just like an incredible story and period of time in history that nobody knows. I think that's the fun part is that, you know, it isn't something – people are familiar with so i think it'll catch them off guard a little bit oh it's funny gabe um he made a beautiful film with with red army and my comment to him when i went up to him after the screening was hey you know you've just created a beautiful recollection of this fabled hockey club i said if you want the beast (laughs) the disaster that ensued after the collapse of communism I got to talk to you. So we had lunch, and and his mouth was open for most of the lunch, and that's sort of the reaction that this film has. It's it's jaw dropping, it's it's bizarre, and it's also one of the great moments in sports that no no one really knows about because it happened in a vacuum in Russia. So it, it, we luckily saved the of, enough of the uh, archival material, the videos, the contracts, et cetera. So we had a, a, a ton of material for the film. So, yeah, Gabe, Gabe, he was reticent about making this film. As a matter of fact, we call it the unsequel to Red Army. But at the same time, um, I think it gave the sports world an interesting look at the chaos and the madness that ensued, you know, in Russia after communism took a fall. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes, the uncomfortable and uh, somewhat haunting laughter of the Central Red Army's general manager, Valeri Gushin. Stephen, when you first saw that footage, after you gave all the stories to Gabe about what you went through over in Moscow, (laughs) what was it like to see him just cackling like that into the camera? And he is uh, like Rasputin, I call him. Not good. Gabe is great at leaving the camera on his subjects for what seems like too long, and it's, it creates this tension in the filming. When Gushin starts laughing like a hyena, when I had made the point that there was mafia, that he had befriended, that were watching me and, and following me and copying my documents and breaking into my office when I wasn't there. And so, yes, he was, he was sort of this demonic guy that... He had good intentions, but he was raised like most Soviets, which is to hate America and not to trust Americans. So, um, you know, we would drink a lot together, which is the the main language that we spoke was vodka over there. Um, Everyone understood that. And I remember that he would he would say to me, hey, listen, I really like you personally, but at the same time, you're an American, so I can never trust you. And you know that's that's not a good sign when your partner will not accept you because of your background. And we're experiencing this same type of racism and sexism in the country here. And the xenophobia that I experienced from Russians was profound, and um, and rightly so because of you know the Cold War and and what had you know what they had learned as kids and they were taught all the propaganda that Russia is the greatest and America is the worst and liars and they and so yeah it, it, this was sort of inbred into the culture that you can't trust Americans we really came with the best intentions and wanted to create harmony through hockey and they never trusted us i think that was happening to every company that that went to russia in the 90s but it, you know they just had no idea what they were in for and i think as soon as any company started achieving success financially and sort of marketing and having the ability of success as the Russian Penguins did over time, that that's when kind of the criminal element starts to come in and infiltrate and figure out how they can take the company, basically, like, uh, you know, worm their way in. It was just very guarded the whole time. I think paranoid, suspicious, who is this guy? Kind of he speaks a little bit of Russian me. And, you know, but I, I don't know, what is this guy trying to get, you know? And he was kind of giving me very generic responses and, you know, but eventually I kind of worked and worked him and, and he got a little bit of tired and maybe just opened up and like was maybe even like, you know, and he just kind of let loose a few times, you know, and you catch him off guard. And, he, you know, when I was talking about kind of the mafia and their involvement with the team and, 
and and then Steve, he just found it absolutely hilarious. The the remembering basically what happened with Steve Warshaw and the team, and how I, I think really that he he enjoyed kind of intimidating Steve, and he enjoyed you know the fact that Steve was basically like uh, threatened out of the country. You know, he he kind of he like he liked that. I used to say to Valeri Gushin, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And I said, we're expecting you to steal 100000 from us, but you're stealing a million. That is completely unacceptable. Um, so, yes, that was a – he. you know, they just didn't understand that there was a, a threshold that would lead to their Pittsburgh Penguins leaving, and that's exactly what happened. You know, one character that appears in both uh, Red Army and Red Penguins is the head coach, Victor Tikhanov. Certainly a divisive individual, a polarizing, I think would be an understatement. Talk about the dynamic that Tikhanov brought to this team. And did any of his players like him? Yeah, I mean, Tikhanov is regarded as probably one of the great coaches of all time, but but I think it's debatable whether he's actually a great coach or whether he was just able to recruit because of the Army, all the best players of the Soviet Union. So if you were good in, in Soviet Union, then then you're going to the Army, you know, and you have, you have no say about that. So he had all the best players, and a lot of players say that, you know, that's why he was good. Otherwise, he, he just wouldn't be a good coach. So... He used all that power and intimidation and and control on his players. Wouldn't allow them to go to, you know, see their wives or leave the army base ever. He was just, you know, like a, a dictator. And uh, as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, he he lost all of his great play, all the players to the NHL. It was it was it was just embarrassing. Not only did he Politically, they sort of lost to the U.S. in a way. Uh, economically, they were bankrupt. You know, it was a shame. It was a shame. And he had to basically go to the NHL to, uh, to try and get investment to someone or somebody to help the Red Army team and buy them. And, hmm. and so then after the collapse, the, the, the team, Red Army team, wasn't good because they didn't have – any good players, and, and frankly, it was just, I see it as like just like almost hilariously embarrassing and ironic that he goes from being the greatest coach to like literally a terrible team, <laughs> and and nobody was going to the games, and then, then you have this American ownership that's doing all this crazy marketing of the team, even though it was a bad team. So it's like, hey, come see this thing. Get free toilet paper and free razors and watch the strippers halftime show. But but there was no hockey to watch. So Steve Warshaw filled the, the, the Red Army Arena eventually. But but the, what were they watching? They were watching crap, you know, and, the, and Tikhanov had to be on the bench coaching this stuff. And it, it must have been just, like, so embarrassing and shameful. You know, Victor Tikhanov, he, he, he never lived down the 1980 Olympics debacle. Um, and that sort of was a stain. I remember when HBO sent their film crews to do a feature, you know, whether it was called Disaster on Ice from their vantage point. Um, but the film crews got to Moscow and he refused to talk to HBO. He just literally walked away. He stayed, many years later refused to discuss it. But he had a, he had an interesting side, although he was, you know, petrified of Americans and didn't trust us from the first day. Um, he had a funny, softer side. And I remember opening night, my plan was to dress an acrobat in Dmitry Starostenko's uniform. Now, Starostenko was a New York Rangers draft pick uh, who had just been called up right before our season was about to start, but no one knew where he was. So I had an acrobat down on a rope from the top of the arena wearing Starostenko's uniform. But in the in the pre uh, in the pre-meetings for for the game, I remember that Tikhanov was there, and he said to me, "There's no way he's going to allow us to to make a joke of the sport of hockey by having an acrobat come out of the top of the arena with the puck to give to the referee to start the game." And I finally just explained to him, "Look, we need to have excitement." And finally, he says, "Okay, I'll let you do this under one condition." 
and everyone was listening, what's the condition? And he said, that it's you, Warshaw, that's going to be up on that rope coming down with the puck. I said, I'll do it because I have a climbing background. And then there was a silence in the room. He said, good, because I'm going to be up at the top of the arena with a pair of scissors cutting the rope. <laughs> so, so we had this sort of wow. funny, funny side of him. But most of it was not that funny. Um, he was a, you know, he's a, a staunch old communist um, who was a, you know, member of the army, and he would remember he would just disrupt families. Uh, Alexander McGilney, perfect example. He was thirteen, eleven time zones away in Khabarovsk, um, and Tikhonov heard about McGilney. He sent his army guys there. They literally grabbed him from his parents, and they said, "If you don't come and join the army, you're going to be put in prison." So he ran that team with an iron fist, and the players really hated him. And as a matter of fact, there are awful stories about the legends of the Red Army, who, and they've told me these stories where Tikhonov wouldn't even let the players see their wives or girlfriends while they were at the training base. He gave them five minutes a month to have sex outside the barracks, you know, in the snow. Um, and if you're mother or father was dying, you couldn't go to the hospital and see them. You had to wait till they were dead, and then they'd let you out for the funeral. I mean, it was a really brutal existence in the, in the Red Army barracks. For 11 months a year, uh, they were literally prisoners. You know, they, that's, that was their job. They couldn't do anything but play hockey. And one of the Olympians told me, Russians, that the, the pay scale was simple. If you win a gold medal, you get $10,000. If you get a silver medal, you get nothing. So the pressure, you know, that was involved with Tikhonov and that team was uh, incredible. So, yeah, he, he, he had a little soft side to him, but he was also a vicious, you know, ruthless dictator. And that's how he ran his program. That, and that's why they were so successful, unfortunately. He really, he was a very powerful guy until the collapse. And then in the film, obviously, we address what happens when the army realizes that Tikhonov and Gushin are not capable of running this joint venture and the fact that it's making so much money that they wanted to take the team back from Tikhonov and Gushin. And that's what led to one of the great moments, unfortunately this wasn't filmed, is when the Russian army tried to take the team back from Gushin and Tikhonov and they brought soldiers with guns. And Tikhonov and Gushin hired Spetsnaz, which is the special forces division, to defend them from the army. So there were, there were the Spetsnaz and the army outside of the arena with guns pointed at each other. Um, yeah, so it got crazy. I can't even imagine. I, I am curious, Gabe, how much of an element of fear was involved in making this movie? It seems like there was, you know, you were certainly being watched at times. Yeah, I mean, I'm generally not a paranoid guy, and I'm not like... Uh, you know, scared of spiders or, or you know, and any kind of, I, I'm not that like of a scaredy cat guy, but, but I, but when I was there at the time, and this is kind of when the U S sanctions were starting and were getting kind of really aggressive, the feeling there was definitely very dark. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why or whatever, but I felt, uh, I didn't necessarily feel being watched or something, but just, it was, it was a very, different feeling a darker feeling and ultimately towards the end of the shoot we were going to interview this kgb prosecutor uh guy and basically during the end of the interview the guy started talking you know very openly about kind of russia and what the issues are and, and what's happening in the country He's talking about in kind of a negative way and he just kept going and going and all of a sudden this guy, this sort of overweight guy, was standing behind us, like just listening for five minutes or so. And finally, I kind of stopped the interview and said, well, what, you know, I said the truth. like, who the hell is this guy? Well, what's... And then right after I said that, about five cops showed up and, and got us, basically said that there's a bomb in the area. And, uh, and they basically told us to get out of there immediately. And so I thought that that was really odd. Yeah, there was a lot of business killings at the time, a lot of just, you know, if someone looked like they had money, that they, you're, you're, you know, you got to be real careful there at that time. And so, I mean, Steve could have just as easily just, like, been robbed and killed on the streets, and 
you know, a, a business killing for the Red Pe- Russian Penguins, you know? It was just that kind of time. I mean, in mm-hmm. fact, like, people were, as you saw in the film, like, killing the wrong people. They thought there were other people. Yeah. It was pretty wild. In terms of fear and my life, um, definitely a fear of being beaten because people were beaten all the time in Russia, right in broad daylight, um, to send a message. And unfortunately, a lot of the contract killings by the mafia were mistakes. And without giving too much away, our assistant coach, Vladimir Bogic, ends up getting five bullets in his head in front of his wife, right in front of the arena. He was on his way to play tennis. Unfortunately, there was another guy in the building that was also going to play tennis that afternoon, and he didn't get killed, and our assistant coach was gunned down by accident. So the fear of being killed because they were so disorganized, the crime syndicate, that they made mistakes all the time and killed the wrong people. So, you know, yes, you're afraid of being killed, and you're also afraid of accidentally being killed or beaten. So it was, a, it was, it was not a good feeling. And Gabe, with all the drama that continues to this day with Russian sports, might you revisit this material, maybe for part of a trilogy? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I never set out again to be make films about Russia or hockey or anything. It's somehow just came my way and maybe it's destiny I don't know but as far as uh, doing there could definitely be another one I I like what I liked about this was that it was sort of I liked the tone I knew this was going to be a real dark comedy like really strange and have a lot of layers for people who like might like like Big Lebowski or Fargo like they'll love this film or people who just like you know, politics or a good sports story, or there is a possibility of another one, kind of with uh, the 2000s and and the oligarchs and how the KHL came and 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 how U.S. players would basically experience what it was like in Russia in the 2000s. You know, but there's a lot of crazy stories. Well, that'll do it for this week's edition of Post Game Central on Sports Map Radio. My thanks to Gabe Polsky and Stephen Warshaw, who joined me from Red Penguins, available today from Universal Pictures, streaming and video on demand. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.